Okay, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Combined Grand Rounds. Uh, before we have Dr. Durkay come up and, and uh, join us and, and um, speak to us a little bit about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, uh, which is an interesting topic yeah, given uh, in light of the HPV epidemic, uh, just want to make a couple of announcements. The first is that uh, I'm sure that everybody marked on their calendar and has been waiting anxiously for Thyroid Awareness Month, which is September. Um, and there's a screening that's going to be done. It's actually headed up by Dr. Tang and Dr. Yao. That'll be in the atrium September 10th from 11 to 2 p.m. Anybody who wants to attend it should feel uh, welcome. Friday, September 8th, uh, 18th. Friday, September 18th. Uh, there is a gathering, uh, a retreat for the Thyroid Collaborative. Emails went out. I strongly recommend that if you treat thyroid disease, you may want to attend this. It's a group that's put together. It's a multidisciplinary group. It's the um, beginning of the development of this collaborative to treat the academic tr uh, approach to treatment of thyroid disease. And it's a kind of a, a gathering of the otolaryngology teams uh, across the system, general surgery, uh, the endocrine group, uh, endocrinology, imaging, molecular biology, uh, population health, um, the list goes on and on. And what we're going to do is we're bringing everybody together for a retreat. It'll start at about 8 o'clock. It'll go until about 1. And the concept is to develop an academic uh, nidus for growth of both clinical trials, basic science, and recruitment. And it's the kind of thing that hopefully in other divisions, uh, laryngology, pediatrics, all the other divisions you all are thinking about doing. Um, so if you treat or have an interest, I would strongly recommend that if there are residents or fellows that are free on that Friday, the 18th, that they attend. It should be a very interesting opportunity to kind of pull together all the resources that we have across the institution. We did this in head and neck cancer about 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, and that led to the head and neck cancer center, which now has, you know, five or six million dollars in funding and has 15 different clinical trials, and, and it was very successful. So we want to try to create the same thing in thyroid disease. So I, I welcome you and encourage you to come. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a recruitment event down at the academy meeting. The Academy meeting uh, at Dallas Fish Market on Monday, September 28th. Uh, if you're free, uh, come on by. The uh, uh, Another email will be sent out. Um, it's designed to meet new young potential faculty that are interested in coming up to Mount Sinai. Uh, the um, alumni reception down at the Academy is, so for everybody in this room who's down at the Academy meeting in Dallas, will be on September 29th at the Omni Hotel. Uh, so be aware of that. And, you know, we'd like to see as many of you who are down there in Dallas come by that alumni event. It's always good to have uh, the current faculty and the residents meet some of the alumni from both programs of i &E and and Mount Sinai. It's a great way for the, for the residents and the fellows to network and, and meet, fac uh, meet uh, graduates who are looking for people uh, to join their practice, so I would encourage you to show up. Dr. Chernobylsky's uh, Inspire Therapy, um, it's not really a trial anymore because it's FDA approved, is open, and that's a hypoglossal nerve stimulation. I guess you're still accruing kind of for trial and study. Um, so Fred Lynn is going to be trained to do that up here, and obviously Boris is doing it downtown, so that's getting off. Uh, the blocks, if you have trials that need to be uh, crewed for, let me know and we can make these announcements before Grand Round so that way uh, those who are listening and all those in the room have an opportunity to understand what trials are going on. There's a section of the website that will list all the active trials moving forward so you can look to see and we'll send out announcements periodically so that way you're aware of what trials exist for your patients. Anyways, I'm going to let Dr. Bernstein come on up and introduce Dr. Dirk Kay and then we'll get started. And uh, otherwise, I welcome everybody. Good morning. Um, it is my honor this morning to introduce 
our grand round speaker, Dr. Craig Durkay. Dr. Durkay is a professor of otolaryngology and the vice chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. He holds a joint appointment in the Department of Pediatrics at the medical school and is director of pediatric otolaryngology at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. Dr. Durkay has served our specialty as president of ASPO, the American Society of Pediatric Otolaryngology, as well as president of CENTAC, the Society for Ear, Nose, and Throat Advancements in Children, as well as having been the chair of the American Academy of Otolaryngology's Pediatric Otolaryngology Committee. He currently chairs the Otolaryngology Advisory Council for the ACS, for the American College of Surgeons, as well as the ASPO Recurrent Respiratory Papilloma Task Force. <clears throat> Dr. Durkay has authored more than 130 peer-reviewed publications and 25 book chapters. He has secured funding for his research from the NIH and from the CDC. When Dr. Durkay is not busy providing expert clinical care and administering and providing leadership to the various facets of our specialties, he, is, he and his wife of 27 years, Dr. Chris Kennedy, find time to care for a three-legged dog, a four-legged cat, and use much of their free time to run, hike, mountain bike, and snowshoe. Dr. Durkay is an internationally recognized expert in the management of RRP, the study of RRP, uh, and the treatment, and it is my privilege and our privilege to have him speak to us this morning about updates in recurrent respiratory papillomas. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the kind words and the large crowd at 7.30 on a, uh, Thursday morning. It's also nice to see uh, some uh, familiar faces from my former residents, uh, South House areas in the, the audience and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come up uh, here to the city and uh, talk to you about something I have a lot of passion about. I have no disclosures and this is uh, a typical child with respiratory papilloma disease. For the uh, students and uh, trainees in the audience, uh, RRP is also known as laryngeal papilloma. It's caused by the HPV subtype 6 and 11, which are also the ones that are responsible for causing uh, genital warts. It's the most common benign neoplasm of the larynx among children, the second most frequent cause of chronic childhood hoarseness. And we've done uh, several epidemiological studies and estimate somewhere between 600 and 1,000 new pediatric cases every year in the U.S., uh, and because these kids need a lot of surgeries, it comes out to almost 10,000 surgical procedures and more than $100 million in healthcare costs. Most commonly, the children will present between two and four years of age, three quarters are diagnosed by their fifth birthday, and there's almost a year between the onset of the symptoms uh, before somebody puts a flexible scope in there and uh, discovers that the child has warts in their larynx. There is a relationship between the age of presentation, the severity, more severe disease is uh, present in those that have been diagnosed prior to their third birthday. And the clinical triad is really that of hoarseness, strider, and um, uh, respiratory obstruction. Transmission is believed to be through exposure to the virus when traversing the birth canal of an infected mother. And additional risk factors um, that we've been able to, to pinpoint are being firstborn, having a prolonged second stage of labor, and being a young mother. But it's not that simple because HPV is pretty ubiquitous in the uh, genital urinary tract of uh, uh, women with, of childbearing age, but RRP is rare. And the risk of contracting the disease is somewhere between 1 in 250 and 1 in 400 if the mother has an actively shedding condylomata at the time of birth. Um, and we've recognized that about one out of every 100 RRP patients is delivered by way of, of cesarean section, while the C-section rates in the U.S. are between 15 and 25 percent. So our colleagues in uh, ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, do not recommend an elective C-section just because the woman has a, a genital wart. Other modes of transmission in children may be iatrogenic if, um, if our anesthesia colleagues don't change the, the uh, tubing uh, after a papilloma case, exposure in the amniotic fluid, and occasionally secondary to child abuse. The most common 
misdiagnosis is that the child gets labeled as being asthmatic or having recurrent croup. The prognosis is very variable. There's some children who only need one or very few lifetime procedures, while others may need more than 100. And it's unclear whether we're seeing a decline in the incidence and the prevalence of papilloma since the initiation of the HPV vaccination program nine years ago. And uh, CDC um, has funded us to uh, be the uh, PIs of a uh, nationwide study to look at this. Adult onset disease is thought to be either due to reactivation of pediatric disease or as a result of a sexually transmitted disease during adulthood. Adult disease seems to be much less aggressive clinically that, that adults with RRP need fewer yearly surgeries, but it still can progress to chronic lung disease and squamous cell carcinoma. And the question is, is it biologically different or is the adult larynx just larger than the child's larynx and better able to accommodate a larger volume of disease? Adult disease we have found is worsened by exposure to tobacco, radiation therapy, and reflux. And uh, a lot of adults can tolerate office surgical procedures for removal, while that would be very rare in children. Um, we've uh, developed a staging system for this. That, uh, staging, I think, is very important because you can have an objective measure of treatment effects. It, uh, it promotes communication regarding research and surgeon-to-surgeon -surgeon referrals. Uh, we put together a system uh, back in 1998 that has a high level of surgeon-to-surgeon -surgeon reliability with uh, low variance and seems to work uh, well among different providers. Basically, we grade the papillomas as either being a surface lesion, a raised lesion, or a bulky lesion, and we break the aerodigestive tract into 23 different sites, and you add up the numbers, and you can go from uh, surgery to surgery, and you know, a child that was a 12, a 12, a 12, and then they drop down to a, a four after their first dose of sidofovir, you can uh, uh, objectively say that things are, are improving. HBB infections are divided into three clinical categories, anogenital, non-genital cutaneous, and non-genital mucosal, and the HPV subtypes can cause disease in more than one clinical category. More than 25 million Americans currently have a genital HPV infection, and the CDC says that there are about 6.5 million new cases every year. Fortunately, in most people, more than 90% of the time, um, the, your innate immune system will clear the virus within two years. But many people who have HPV don't even know it because the virus often has no signs or symptoms, and it gets passed along to partners without knowing it. And there's currently no way to predict who will and who won't clear the virus. Um, about three quarters of new cases occur in 15 to 24 year olds. And so this really is the population we need to focus on for prevention. This leads to about 26,000 HPV related cancers in the US each year, about 8,500 in males and 17,500 in females. And this leads to about 4,000 deaths from cervical cancer. It's estimated by the CDC that between 75 and almost 100% of sexually active men and women will have at some time been infected with HPV in their lifetime. And again, type 6 and 11 commonly found in genital warts and in RRP. Type 16 and 18 are commonly found in cervical, penile, and anal cancers. And in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. When we uh, talk about the subtypes, that it, it, there are more than 100 closely related types. The typing is based on nucleic acid sequence. And if you have less than 90% sequence identity, you buy a new number. Um, and 6 and 11 are down here and um, were discovered around the same time. So their numbers are close by. Um, for the basic science scientists in the office that uh, HPV is a small non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus. It exists in an episomal state upon infection of the basal epithelium of cutaneous and mucosal surfaces. But persistent infections are characterized by integration of the viral genome, which then increases the expression of oncogenes E6 and E7 due to the interruption of E2. And a lot of the basic science research is focusing on E6, E7, and E2. 
Um, my colleague, uh, Brian Wyattrek down at University of Alabama, Birmingham, did this 10-year prospective study looking at 73 pediatric patients staging performed at each surgery, used our RP staging system and found that those that were infected with HPV-11 were more likely to have higher severity scores, more frequent surgeries, a higher need for adjuvant therapies, higher incidence of tracheal disease, a higher need for tracheotomy, and, and more uh, disease uh, that uh, went down into their lungs. And I also found that those diagnosed under the age of three had higher severity scores, more surgery, and more need for adjuvant therapies. And uh, Fred Dickers from the Netherlands uh, last year um, uh, did a res retrospective cohort of 55 patients over almost 40 years, encompassing more than 800 procedures, and found about three quarters were HPV-6 and a quarter were HPV-11. And again, early age of onset and HPV-11 associated with more aggressive course. Sometimes it takes a celebrity's misfortune to educate the public and uh, Michael Douglas, uh, Jim Kelly, Kurt Schilling all uh, recently have been diagnosed with head and neck cancers. Um, traditionally, head and neck cancer is associated with uh, uh, overuse of tobacco and alcohol or exposure to chemicals in the workplace. But we're now recognizing that about 60% are associated with HPV infection. Um, the most recent estimates are about 35,000 new cases of head and neck cancer a year with 12,000 deaths despite um, intensive therapy. More than twice as common in males versus females and, and men are more than twice as likely to die from head and neck cancer. It also disproportionately affects uh, African Americans with younger age of incidence, increased mortality and more advanced disease at presentation. The highest distribution of the HPV positive head and neck cancers is in the tonsils, followed by the hypopharynx, the oral cavity, and the larynx. And we're seeing an increasing incidence of these cancers, that there's an increasing incidence of oropharyngeal cancers, both in women and men, despite a really huge reduction in the number of chronic smokers in the United States in the last 40 years. The increasing incidence of head and neck cancers seems to be in the younger age cohort of non-smoker, non-drinkers. And these are the, the HPV positive folks. And several studies have indicated that oral HPV is a sexually acquired cancer. HPV positive status is also associated with a, a perhaps a more favorable prognosis compared to HPV negative. The HPV positive tumors may be a completely distinct epidemiological, biological, and clinical subset of tumors. And this has implications for treatment, that they may be more amenable to anti-epithelial uh, uh, growth factor type therapies and prevention with HPV vaccination. And I briefly was talking to Brett Miles about uh, the study that you guys are doing with the uh, HPV vaccination for oral cancer. This is also further positive implication for adding vaccination of boys to that of girls for uh, the um, uh, HPV uh, vaccine for prevention. Uh, the CDC has really gotten on board in the last two years to try to increase the vaccination rates in the United States. Um, the little bit of history on this that uh, Merck got their uh, original Gardasil approved by the FDA in 2006 for females, nine to 26 years of age. And then in 2009 for males, nine to 26. The uh, Cerevix, which is only uh, makes up about 1% of the vaccination uh, program in the US was approved in 2009 for girls only. The main target group in the US is for both vaccines has been the 11 to 12 year old girl prior to becoming sexually active with catch-up vaccination for the older cohort. Um, from an economic standpoint, it was uh, very uh, important that the Federal Vaccine for Children program included girls and boys um, for uh, use of, of the HPV vaccine, that this provides vaccine for uh, children that are covered by Medicaid and uh, S-CHIP. Um, in December of 2014, the FDA approved the nine-valent vaccine and in February of this year, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Vaccine Committee, the ACIP, added the nine valent vaccine to its recommendations. Um, in terms of boys, that uh, in 2011, the ACIP uh, changed their recommendation from 
a permissive uh, recommendation to a routine uh, vaccination recommendation. Uh, the indication was for prevention of genital warts, penile, and anal cancers. And they also recommend vaccination of uh, young adult uh, men who are immune compromised or for uh, uh, homosexual men uh, who didn't receive any or all doses when they were younger. So the nine valent vaccine is a three dose vaccine given initially and then two months and six months after the initial dose. Um, and it is approved for boys and girls nine to 26 years. Um, the immunogenicity and safety trial was done in uh, 3,000 women, 16 to 26 years of age, and it's a very good vaccine, more than 99% seroconverted for each of the nine HPV types. They had excellent responses in girls and boys that were non-inferior to those um, of young women. There was a persistent uh, response demonstrated two and a half to three years after the third dose. It was generally well tolerated with only mild injection site uh, adverse events, and they conclude that the data support the guidelines that were adopted by ACIP. And um, the, the key here is that with the uh, four-valent uh, vaccine, that you were only covering about 70% of cervical cancer, but when you go up to nine-valent, you're now uh, able to cover about 92% of the uh, HPV subtypes that cause cervical cancer and all of the relevant ones that cause uh, oropharyngeal carcinomas. And the worldwide disease coverage that uh, with the nine valent vaccine, you're now gonna cover 90% of cervical cancers, 90% um, of vulvar cancers, 85% of vaginal cancers, almost 95% of anal cancers, 80% of the high-grade cervical precancers, half of the low-grade uh, cervical lesions, and 90% of the genital warts. And this is a really good vaccine. As vaccines go, uh, this, this is top of the class, that um, in women who got Gardasil, it prevented 100% of HPV 16 and 18 related cervical precancers and non-invasive cervical cancers. That's the big zero in the vaccine group versus 53 in the placebo group. It prevented 95% of the low-grade cervical dysplasias and precancers caused by HPV 6, 11, 16, or 18. It prevented 99% of the general warts caused by HPV 6 or 11. That's only one in the vaccine group versus 91 in the placebo group. And in the uh, boys uh, trial, it prevented 90% of the general warts. And it, um, it, it has a good, um, uh, efficacy at least five years out, and now the data is almost 13 years out with a 100% vaccine efficacy for HPV 6 and 11, five years out. And um, this is really a, a key slide that if you get an HPV infection and you are uh, have a normal immune system, then you develop a, 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 a relatively modest amount of um, uh, anti-HPV antibody to your infection. But if you get the vaccine, you get a several log level higher response um, uh, to uh, having received the vaccine and it plateaus out uh, after about four or five years so that there's uh, unlikely to be a need to do a booster dose. Uh, in the Nordic study, the original study on this, that the average follow-up is uh, 10 years, but some of the subjects are out 13 years, and there have been no new cases involving the relevant subtypes. It's been 100% protective in the 20,000 women that uh, got this vaccine 10 years ago. It also appears to offer a high level of cross protection that the immunological persistence uh, demonstrated with high level of antibodies at one year after the third dose is at 100%, and at six years, it drops down to 99 to 100%. So again, it's very unlikely that, that these uh, women and, and boys are gonna need to have a booster dose. Um, and from the RRP standpoint, that it, the antibodies cross the placenta. And so this is really exciting, because if, if a woman has uh, been given the vaccine, um, she's uh, going to pass uh, the antibodies uh, through the placenta to the, the newborn and uh, potentially protect them against uh, HPV infection. These are uh, The vaccine is a virus-like particle vaccine. It's the same uh, concept between the uh, hep B vaccine, uh, 
Virus-like particle vaccines contain repetitive high-density displays of viral surface proteins, which then present a conformational viral epitope that can elicit both a strong T cell and B cell immune response. Additionally, since these vaccines lack genetic material, they provide a safer alternative to attenuated viruses, but they're not designed to have any effect on the episomal state in established epithelial infections. And this was shown in this Costa Rican study where uh, 2,000 women who uh, had a, a, a biopsy positive um, a lesion at the time they were given the vaccine showed no evidence of increased viral clearance at six or 12 months. And so the conclusion is that vaccination in women should not be used to treat prevalent infections. Um, so you need to give the vaccine before the children become exposed to the virus. Now, um, in Virginia, uh, I'm sure that uh, none of our children um, uh, start having uh, sexual relations under the age uh, of uh, 15. But in New York, it might be a little bit different. And in the, in the studies, the median rate of serological positive subjects at the baseline of the study was only 1.7% at age 12. But if you wait till the uh, children get to be 15, then almost 16% of them uh, have already serologically uh, converted. HPV vaccination may be um, beneficial in patients who have aggressive RRP. That this was a European study that looked at 11 patients with very aggressive RRP, uh, given three doses and then followed out about five years. And the mean surgical intervals doubled. The mean number of yearly surgeries went from two down to one, and they uh, found complete remission in one of the patients, a partial response in seven, and no response in three. And obviously, there's a small study, longer follow-up is, ne is necessary, but there's virtually no harm with a potential upset upside to giving the vaccine to, to uh, uh, patients with uh, aggressive RRP. And the, our RRP task force is working with Merck to do a, a national study uh, to provide the vaccine to a large cohort of uh, RRP patients. Um, our colleagues down at uh, MUSC uh, did a retrospective chart review of 20 patients who received Gardasil as part of their treatment. They did see a significant increase in the inner surgical interval of about three months with a better response in, in males than in females. Eight of the patients had a complete response, five patients had partial responses, and they concluded that Gardasil can modulate the severity of RRP and induce remission in some patients with the effect greater in males. Again, this is a cohort with a mixture of therapies, ages, surgeons, the mechanism of action is uncertain, but it's encouraging and needs repeating in a prospective fashion. And this is probably the reason why some people respond that um, uh, Farrell Buczynski um, uh, did this study along with Merck where they uh, measured the anti-HPV uh, circulating antibody levels in 72 patients with RRP. And they found that about 15% of the cohort had no detectable anti-HPV antibodies to their uh, papilloma. And so it, it would make some sense that in these people who make no serological response, to their own virus if you gave them the vaccine that you might uh, see a therapeutic benefit. So we got to get into the routine of recommending cancer prevention. There, there was a problem when, um, you know, as a Monday morning quarterback, when Merck first came out with the vaccine, they really pushed it hard. Um, and the message kind of got out to the public that you're trying to prevent a sexually transmitted disease when in fact we're trying to prevent cancer. So HPV vaccination uh, rates have been relatively low despite the excellent effectiveness and safety profile of the vaccine. The top five reasons given by parents who did not intend to vaccinate their daughters was that they didn't feel that the vaccine was needed, that the vaccine was not recommended by their MD, shame on those pediatricians, safety concerns, lack of knowledge about the vaccine or disease, or that their child was not sexually active and so they didn't need the vaccine. Most of these concerns can be addressed quickly and easily by a strong recommendation by their pediatrician. And in a comprehensive report from the CDC and the ACIP on HPV vaccination, they have 
uh, made a big push for the AAP chapters to try to increase vaccination coverage in the United States, that they're just asking the pediatricians to strongly recommend the vaccine, to explain that the vaccine prevents cancer, to listen to the parents' questions, but emphasize the recommendations at 11 to 12 years of age. And the, the uh, um, program is called Less is More, that stop talking about this um, endlessly and just uh, recommend the vaccine. Um, one of the other uh, uh, solutions to the problem may be consider settling for less than three doses. So you, you do get a durable antibody response following a single dose of the vaccine. Um, three is better than one, but a single dose of the vaccine does produce five to nine times the uh, geometric mean titers than a non-immunized seropositive woman would get at 48 months that two doses uh, increase the through response 14 to 24 times uh, and three doses uh, between 100 and 1,000 times. These levels are lower, but they may have particular relevance in developing nations with limited resources and in developed nations with poor adherence to the recommendations. It also argues for the use of the nine valent vaccine to take advantage of the cross protection. And Merck is currently uh, funding a trial of the two-dose regimen of the nine-valent vaccine, and the results of this uh, should be out in 2017. They're also pushing for approval to administer by pharmacists. You can get a flu shot at Walgreens or CVS. You may soon be able to get your HPV vaccine there, uh, as long as there's a supervision agreement with the um, primary care doctors. And again, the less is more campaign. Stop over-explaining the vaccine. Treat it in the same casual and informative fashion as you do with all the other vaccines. In 2014, the World Health Organization changed its, its HPV vaccination recommendation to a two-dose schedule um, with uh, the doses separated by six months if the first dose was administered prior to the 15th birthday. Our European uh, colleagues in 2014, the European Medicine Agency, which is kind of their FDA, approved the two-dose regimen for adolescents. And um, our um, uh, Canadian uh, National Advisory Committee in February this year began recommending a two-dose regimen for nine to 14-year-olds. There's already evidence that the vaccine um, is having an effect on um, uh, uh, health the genital wart incidence has decreased in the vaccinated age groups in Australia, Denmark, Sweden, and in parts of the United States where we've uh, really tracked it. The prevalence of HPV vaccine types in sexually active young women has declined in Ohio and Indiana, with some herd protection noted that the cervical precursor lesions have been halved in the immunized age bracket after population-wide HPV vaccination program in Australia. And in the U.S., there's been a 33% decrease from 2008 and 2011 in the proportion of the precursor lesions in the vaccinated versus non-vaccinated women in five states that the uh, CDC has under uh, close surveillance. And this is the Australian program that uh, prior to uh, the vaccination program, the uh, per uh, percentage of uh, genital warts has plummeted. Um, down uh, to uh, uh, one or two percent. Um, so despite how good this vaccine is, we're only getting 60 percent of teenage girls and 42 percent of teenage boys to get at least one dose in the past year. That is an improvement of three and eight percent, but it's not good enough. Uh, the 2013 statistics were that only 37% of the girls received all three back, all three doses, and 14% of the boys received all three doses. There have been more significant increases in the five areas of the, the U.S. that were supported by the CDC's Prevention and Public Health Fund. It's still lagging other adolescent vaccines, and the recommendation from the CDC is send out reminders, launch these public communication campaigns, establish links between the cancer organizations and the immunization organizations to try to improve the vaccine rates. And the, the $64 million question is, can we prevent RRP by widespread implementation of the HPV vaccine? 
Um, would vaccinating a woman drastically lower the risk of RRP in her children? And the, ep the epidemiologists tell us that if you can cover more than 80% of one gender, you're likely to induce enough herd immunity for the HPV types to um, uh, make a big difference. You can decrease the prevalence of 6 and 11 in the population. The herd immunity should lower the risk of RRP, even of children of of unvaccinated women. And for those of you in the audience with a little bit of gray hair or maybe no hair who were resident or uh, young attendings in the era before the HIV vaccine, when the most common uh, pediatric ENT um, emergency was acute epiglottitis, um, now see that we don't see acute epiglottitis in children because all the, the children in the US or very high proportion are getting the HIV vaccine. So how can we um, increase the vaccination coverage? Australia does it through a school-based vaccination program. The UK has a school-based vaccination program. The Netherlands uh, have nearly 100% vaccination levels because the vaccine is free and mandatory to get into sixth grade. In uh, my state, along with Texas, D.C. and Nevada, we do have uh, mandatory vaccination programs prior to starting middle school with an easy opt-out. New Hampshire has a free voluntary program and 24 states are considering legislation, but it's an election cycle. And so, you know, uh, some of our uh, ill-informed politicians politicized this and have managed to um, uh, keep the state legislatures from uh, approving um, uh, mandatory programs. There's opposition from civil libertarians, from what's called the anti-vaccine movement and the religious rights, with concerns that uh, the vaccination may encourage sexual activity, much in the same way, I guess, that if you wear a seatbelt, that's going to encourage you to drive drunk. I don't get it. The addition of vaccination of boys will significantly increase the cost of the program, but it will add to herd immunity. And that has the early push to require uh, HPV vaccine uh, backfired. If you Monday morning quarterback this, you can maybe uh, uh, fault uh, Merck for not waiting for the boy data before they got the single gender indication because it seemed to energize the opposition. Um, the Merck uh, folks put on a hard legislative push uh, when Gardasil first came out, which turned off a lot of the state legislators. And the Hep B and the meningococcal vaccines have been well accepted and mandated, and um, they are compatible. You can give both vaccines or all three vaccines at the same time, and it doesn't change the immunogenicity. It's not too late to regroup with new messaging for cancer prevention with the introduction of the nine-valent vaccine. But there is an anti-vaccine movement in the U.S., uh, vaccination ethics is settled law in both federal and state courts, upholding vaccination mandates for children, mandating immunization for school attendance clearly increases the immunization rates. The DPT and meningococcal vaccine are also given at age 11 and 12, so it's only a minor inconvenience, especially if we go down to just two doses. Exceptions uh, are incorporated into vaccine programs to allow for individual medical, religious, or philosophical objections. And you can set the program up as an opt-in or an opt-out, but it's much better if you do it as an opt-out. The critics contend that abstinence is a safe alternative to vaccination, but abstinence-only sex education programs do not delay the age of sexual initiation or the number of sexual encounters. The critics also fear a disinhibiting effect and encouragement of sexual activity by talking about it. But sex education and distribution of condoms to counter teenage pregnancy and AIDS have not been shown to in increase sexual activity and actually delay initiation. And the cost and the side effects are the real issues, that it's $1.7 billion a year to vaccinate every boy and girl that's 11, and 11 years old and a mass vaccination will likely bring out a few rare serious adverse events. 
Um, the effect of HPV vaccine on sexual mores has been studied uh, uh, by a lot of different researchers, and all the studies suggest that there's no change in sexual practices or activity as a result of receiving the HPV vaccine. And in this uh, cohort of 339 women who completed a questionnaire after their HPV vaccination and then uh, two and six months later, that the risk perceptions after the vaccination were not associated with riskier sexual behaviors over the subsequent six months. And it suggests that the vaccine is not going to encourage sexual activity, much like using a seatbelt doesn't promote reckless driving. The argument against mandatory vaccination, why force healthy children to get the vaccine to prevent against future behavior that might result in disease? Well, this is the principle of every immunization program that we have. This is why we, we immunize against polio and smallpox. You vaccinate the masses to create herd immunity, to protect the relatively few who would otherwise become ill and suffer devastating consequences. This is, this is vaccination 101. The objections raised regarding costs are perhaps legitimate. It's $360 for a full course with the possibility of needing a booster down the road. But treating HPV infections is far more costly. And, and the American Journal of OBGYN estimates an annual cost of cervical HPV-related uh, disease approaches $6 billion a year, not to mention the fiscal and emotional costs of cervical cancer to the affected women and their family. This is the money slide. If you, um, if you add up the cost of uh, cervical cancer screening, treating cervical cancers, other anogenital cancers, oropharyngeal cancers, anogenital warts, and RRP, it comes to more than $6.5 billion a year. But the cost of the vaccination program is only $1.7 billion. So 13 cents spent on vaccination is going to save you a, a dollar in treatment costs. It just makes sense, which is probably why we're not doing it. Adverse reactions. Um, that uh, A lot of, of uh, kids have pain at the injection site and occasionally faint when they get a shot when they're a teenager. 94% uh, of the adverse events are uh, considered minor. 6% uh, were classified as serious. And in the VAERS reporting system, if you get the HPV vaccine and then three months later, you're involved in a fatal car accident, it shows up as vaccine and death. But um, all 20 deaths in uh, the uh, 10,000 people who uh, were uh, part of the VAERS uh, uh, database who died after HPV vaccine were from causes that were explained by factors other than the vaccine. Guillain-Barre syndrome, there's no increased rate above the population. Thromboembolic uh, disorders only occurred in people with other risk factors. And based on the CDC and the FDA reviews, Gardasil continues to be considered to be safe and effective and its benefits outweigh its risks. Um, so I'm going to end the talk by talking about some of the adjuvant therapies besides surgery to treat RRP, uh, sodafovir. It's not perfect, but it's the best that we have these days. There are some controversial areas regarding dosing. It looks like you need to give at least 5 milligrams per ml. The interval, it seems best to commit to give at least a monthly uh, a trial for four to six months. Starting early or late, it appears to benefit uh, patients more if you give it earlier in their disease, but there can be a lot of, of confounding factors in this. And dysplasia malignancy risk, that this is, has really been looked at uh, closely, and it, uh, it seems that it's uh, not higher than with the disease alone. Uh, the risk, unfortunately, goes to the surgeon because you're using an off-label uh, use of the drug. Uh, we pulled together 115 uh, papilloma surgeons uh, and did a sodafovir um, uh, clinical uh, uh, guideline. Uh, this was based upon the experience with uh, using sodafovir in 447 children, and we came up with 18 consensus statements. Basically, it should be considered if uh, a patient uh, needs more than six surgeries in one year, has an increasing frequency of surgery, or has extra laryngeal or bulky disease. Typically, you should dose it under 3 milligrams per kilogram with a concentration between 2.5 to 7.5 milligrams per ml, and you should keep the volume at less than 2 mLs. 
Um, you should schedule a regimen, typically of five treatments. If it doesn't respond within five treatments, go to something else. Routinely biopsy and provide informed consent. Uh, Celebrex are um, your neighbors over at uh, Long Island Jewish, uh, Betty uh, Steinberg et al. Uh, are the um, PIs of the Celebrex study. Our, our institution was one of the uh, five centers that contributed patients. Uh, Celebrex has been approved for use in children over the age of two. It, it affects the estrogen pathway for HPV. Um, this was a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, trial with a six-month drug-free startup to try to establish the baseline for comparison of uh, how they respond to the drugs. Uh, our institution um, uh, recruited the last patient who uh, has to uh, go out two years before we can crack the code. There have been some dramatic results, but we don't know yet if the dramatic results were in the treatment group or the placebo group. We hope they were in the treatment group, but we won't know until January 1st. High-dose sublesional Avastin for pediatric RRP. This is the Cincinnati study, open-label consecutive series. Nine children given a subepithelial injection at four to six-week intervals in combination with a KTP laser ablation. All the patients had increased time intervals between injections and decrease in their uh, severity scores, no uh, significant side effects. And, and again, Avastin is a recombinant monoclonal antibody that binds VEGF, useful in retinopathy and metastatic carcinoma, and may have some benefit uh, with HPV as well. Uh, rapid response to systemic Avastin in uh, uh, RRP patients. Uh, this was a, a limited trial in five RRP patients who had progressive recalcitrant, recalcitrant disease. Some of the patients had uh, had more than 30 uh, prior treatments and had uh, uh, all of the patients had been on prior adjuvants and had disease outside of the larynx. They were given between three and 16 courses of IV of Aston. All five had an immediate response. Uh, they needed 18 interventions over 12 months. And again, it's one of these promising alternatives for desperate patients, but note the small series number. Uh, this is where it starts to get exciting. Xenograph model for therapeutic drug testing for, for uh, RRP. This is the personalized medicine approach. The concept was to biopsy a fresh papilloma, then xenograph it into an NSG mouse and serially pass it over multiple generations and then test that papilloma in vivo against a number of different um, uh, agents. In this case, it, it uh, was uh, with Avastin. They found a dramatic therapeutic response versus uh, saline, and it may be a feasible approach to identify therapeutic agents in the treatment of RRP. Um, I chair the RRP Task Force. We're a multidisciplinary group. We meet twice yearly at the Academy and uh, COSM, and we'll be meeting Saturday in Dallas. Uh, we established the Dustin Micah Harper ASPO Research Fund. We've raised $100,000 that generates a $10,000 RRP uh, seed grant um, every other year. Um, it, you apply for it through the core. Um, we coordinate research efforts and assistance to investigators to disseminate information and recruit interested centers and patients. We're coordinating with the CDC on the updated registry. We've formulated best practice statements on sodafovir and other uh, drugs. Um, we are working on several initiatives, including early use of adjuvant therapies, Gardasil administration to all RRP patients, regardless of age, the benefits of subtyping for prognosis and treatment, and establishing the CDC registry to examine the effect of vaccination on the incidence of RRP. And uh, we've also uh, put together a tissue bank down at Emory. The CDC study is a prospective analysis of incidence and prevalence. At 24 children's facilities, we're collecting tissue and blood, uh, as well as doing an extensive history from the families, including their vaccine history and abnormal pap smears. We have uh, 24 uh, major centers involved, and um, we have a $600,000 grant from CDC over the next three years. So uh, I want to uh, thank Joey and Eric and um, uh, everybody who's uh, uh, sat through uh, 
uh, the refresher course on RRP, and I've left a little bit of time uh, to answer questions. These are some of the other uh, things going on in my uh, life. My daughter is getting married on December 6th down in Key West, Florida, to a boy that she met in first grade. My, uh, my wife is a recovering uh, obstetrician gynecologist after 25 years of uh, delivering babies. She's now traveling around the world and doing uh, medical missionary work um, uh, as a urogynecologist. And uh, my son Andy moved out to Hollywood this weekend where he's uh, working on, a, he's uh, in the camera union um, and is uh, working on Teen Wolf, this uh, MTV um, uh, a series that got uh, renewed for its sixth season. Who knew? So uh, thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. What do you recommend? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. One of the, I guess one of the ideas of not vaccinating older kids or older people is that they've already been exposed to HPV. But isn't it possible that with a nine valent vaccine that you're going to cover other types of HPV that aren't that you aren't weren't exposed to, and that there's still some benefit from that? Bingo. You are exactly correct. So it's the reason why there's no harm in giving it to anybody that even if you have an established HPV-6 infection, you're now going to be vaccinated against eight other subtypes. So, so you, you might get papilloma as a child, but you can potentially prevent uh, oral care, oropharyngeal cancer as an adult. Just going on top of that, I mean, a large percentage of the year we're going to do this anyway. So people that have the infection, so I don't see it as a The, I'm sorry, this, because of the WebEx. Um, uh, the question was, uh, the first question was, uh, what's the harm in giving the vaccine to older people or people who already have an infection? And the follow-up question was similar, that you know, e uh, even uh, if you are older and you've had the disease and you've cleared it, getting the vaccine is still going to help you with future infections. Yes. Thanks. I enjoyed the talk very much. Um, we always get this uh, question from adults with RP, and, and you, you're the, the information you gave us seems somewhat contradictory. That is, if there is already already have an infection, uh, the uh, vaccination is not likely to be helpful. But some of the other slides suggest it when it's it's all it is helpful. So can you help us when patients, adult patients, ask us, should I get a vaccine for my condition if they have active papilloma? So uh, I'll try to be a little more clear on what I said, and, and thanks for coming. Um, so in the um, vaccine trial in Costa Rica, they specifically looked at whether the uh, cervical uh, uh, pre-cancer lesions that the women came into the study with, whether they regressed after getting the vaccine um, in two years. And there was no difference in the uh, rate of regression between the women who got the vaccine and the women who didn't get the vaccine. But it does look like there's a, at least a subpopulation, maybe 15 to 20 percent of papilloma patients who have a, make an inadequate immune response to their um, HPV. That they're not immune compromised, but they but there's something wrong with their immune system in the way that it reacts to their HPV infection. And those are the, the ones I believe in those um, uh, RRP uh, therapeutic uh, studies that responded to getting the, the vaccine. Um, we don't have a commercially available assay at the moment. Merck's got one that's in-house, but we don't have <laughs> one where you can uh, just test the patient and see what their levels are and say, well, you'd be a really good candidate, just give it. I mean, it, it, there, there's very little downside other than $360 and a couple of injections to, to just giving it to them. It may help, it's not gonna hurt. I mean, I think that that's the, the thing that Right, that's the key. Is the key is an assay that allows you to, to determine two things. One, do you have 
viral uh, disease at the time? Are you shedding? And two, what's your what's your response? Do you have antibodies? Um, and and what's those level? You know, what are the level of antibodies? Because we'd like to believe that everybody responds the same to all the strains, but they don't. They don't. Um, do you know anything about the the in house assay that they're using and? Um, I don't know uh, the specifics of it. I, I know that I can get it. I have a contact at, at Merck that I, I can send um, blood from my patients up there and they'll do it for free, uh, but it is not commercially available. It's what they used in all of their vaccine trials. And I'm happy to share my contacts with you. Yeah, that'd be great. Just for the adult patients. Yes, sir. So that was a great uh, hey, Mike. Thank you of everything that's going on. Um, and really, I mean, I have a million questions, but I'll spare you only two. Okay. Um, one that I find really difficult is when a, a patient comes in, male or female, they're, they're, they've got RFP of the land and they're single. Mm -hmm. And they want to know if they need to tell new partners whether or not they have the RFP. So that's, that's the first question. How do you handle that? So, you know, I'm an honest guy. I think full disclosure is best policy. And um, there is um, limited data about transmission to partners. Um, I have a slide about this, that there was a, a study from about two years ago in uh, Europe that looked at couples um, and there was no transmission from one partner to the other, but it involved 30 couples. And so, you know, they, they cautiously said, it looks like it's safe um, that you can continue to kiss and have uh, uh, other relations, uh, but um, it doesn't look like it's easily uh, transmitted uh, um, from uh, adult to um, their adult partner orally. Which is different than in the oral pharyngeal uh, disease where tonsil patients who have active disease shed the virus and are much more communicable even than those with basic tongue or larynx. Right. And when we remove those tumors, they no longer uh, you know, shed that virus. So we tell head and neck patients with the active disease to that's to refrain from mm -hmm. uh, you know, sexual activity. And the other question is uh, the difference between sedofavir and avastin. Have you settled on one? Uh, have you settled yeah. On one? You like better? So I, I start with sedofavir because I think we have the most data on sedofavir and that approximately two out of three patients will respond to sedofavir. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, that's that's my go-to first adjuvant therapy, but if they don't respond to sedofavir, my second line is Avastin, my third line is the Pegasus, it's the newer generation of interferon, uh, it's a better tolerated than the, uh, the uh, Rofron used to be. Sal. I had uh, one question about your use of uh, sedofavir in children. You had said five doses. Now, are those patients who are going back to the OR five times in yes. five consecutive months? Okay. Yeah. And, and if they respond, you don't have to do all five. You know, if you get a response after the first one, I do bring them back to a second time to convince myself that they've uh, fully responded. But the the commitment is that we're going to do this five times. And if you haven't responded by, by the fifth dose, then we're going to stop and go on to the next. And one more question. You, you had said that the task force is going to discuss subtyping. Uh, for an initial diagnosis in a pediatric or an adult patient, would you subtype at that first biopsy for prognostic indication? That's that's what we're um, going to advocate for. That uh, the data has 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 gotten robust enough that I think we can make a cogent argument for doing it. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate the invitation.